Hi everyone, welcome to the Nova Central Library. Um, we're happy to have uh, Derek Parks and Diane Capareco here today um, from the NOAA Innovators Series. I'm going to turn it over to, to Derek now and he will introduce Diane. Hey everybody, so this is Derek Parks again with the NOAA Technology Partnerships Office. Um, this is our second NOAA Innovators Series and we're here, for those of you who don't know, to celebrate innovations um, taking part mm -hmm. at NOAA by NOAA scientists, but also we're going to be uh, in the future celebrating some of our grantees, our Cooperative Institute employees, uh, trying to give as broad a description of uh, NOAA's innovations as we possibly can. And um, we are here actually in the library today, and I've got my special guest, uh, Vince Garcia, with the NOAA Small Business Innovation Research Program here with me. So um, if, as a bonus later on when we're doing questions and answers, if anybody has <laughs> questions about SPIR, we can get to those too. But that's not why we're here today. So today we are talking um, with Diane Capreco who is uh, at our Milford Lab, um, National Marine Fisheries Service Lab uh, in Milford. And Diane is uh, an esteemed colleague. She has been working uh, with the federal government for 35 years, uh, an amazing accomplishment. Congratulations, Diane. And she's uh, the principal investigator up there researching and developing probiotics for oysters, which is what she's going to talk about on the, uh, the scientific side with us today. And uh, as part of her work in 2016, Diane and a, a group from, um, from the Milford Lab received the Department of Commerce Silver Medal Award for Scientific Engineering Achievement for the probiotic research that they've done up there. So again, this is just, it's fantastic research, but part of what um, we're doing is in this Innovator Series is also talking a little bit about the commercial side of the applications and um, the work that we're doing to try to get some of our technologies out to industry. And Diane has had a, a really interesting uh, experience working with cooperative research and development agreements and materials transfer agreements and trying to coordinate with industry and uh, she has a good, interesting story to tell us about that. And so what I'm going to do is turn the, the microphone over to Diane. She'll run through her slides and talk about that. And then we're going to do a, kind of a roundtable discussion. We have some questions here, but people from the audience can feel free as well to ask any questions at that time and following as well. And uh, so with that said, I will pass it over to Diane Capreco. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, so today, welcome everybody, and I will be talking about managing bacterial shellfish pathogens in commercial hatcheries, advances in probiotic research at NOAA's Milford Laboratory through public and private partnerships. In 2016, the Food and Agriculture Organization published this graph, which shows that over the past 30 years, um, capture fisheries production has kind of plateaued, as you see here depicted in orange, while aquaculture production has been on a steady increase to provide seafood to an ever-growing ever growing and expanding global population. On a national front, uh, NOAA Fisheries in 2015 has valued the domestic aquaculture product at $1.4 billion, with oysters and clams being two of the most important species being aquacultured on both coasts of the United States. The livelihood of the commercial oyster industry in the United States depends on healthy larvae. Bacterial disease can be a major constraint to growing oyster larvae in commercial hatcheries. So it is very important to develop natural methods to prevent disease in commercial aquaculture facilities that can help sustain the increasing need for seafood and therefore improve nutrition and seafood security and provide uh, sustainable economic benefits to the aquaculture industry in the United States. The Milford Laboratory has been working on um, researching and developing Milford probiotic strain OI-15, which is a naturally occurring from adult oysters, benign strain of Vibrio alginolyticus, which is a common bacteria found in seawater, and we have shown that it improves survival and prevents bacterial disease during aquaculture of the eastern oyster. 
Now, by definition, a probiotic bacteria is a live microbial supplement which beneficially affects the host animal by improving its microbial balance. So an example of that would be we humans eating yogurt. When you're eating yogurt, you're eating live cultures of probiotic bacteria that are beneficial to our digestive system and therefore beneficial to our health and nutrition and overall well-being. Uh, Milford Laboratory has shown that probiotic strain OY15 is in fact safe for use with oyster larvae. It doesn't kill them. Also safe for use with the microalgae TISO that we use as their algal feed. And we have also confirmed that it is safe to be handled by human hatchery workers, but we always recommend wearing gloves. We have found that, in fact, it does work on oyster larvae. A dosage of 10 to the 3 colony forming units of OY15 supplemented with their algal feed every other day until larvae set. So now we're feeding them OY15 from their about when they're two days old out to about three weeks old when they start to actually set and stick to surfaces. And even when they are challenged with a known shellfish larval pathogen, which we've labeled B183, it's a Vibrio coralyticus, which is a coral pathogen, but also is a pathogen to um, eastern oyster larvae as well as to base scallop larvae. Using OY15 every other day during that initial grow out phase until they start to set significantly improves survival by 20 to 35 percent. So to give you a little context um, on this, if you're a commercial oyster grower, you are growing millions upon millions of oyster larvae in any one particular um, batch of larvae, a bacterial pathogen can come in and wipe out your whole crop and you have nothing to grow out and sell as seed oyster at the end of your grow out season. But if you give your larvae um, OY15 every other day, you can have 20 to 35 percent of your crop still to sell at the end of your grow out season at seed oyster. So it is significant. We know how OY15 works to exert its probiotic effects. It works by immune stimulation. So oysters have a very innate, simple immune system based on their white blood cells. And as you see in the photo on the right, the larger of the three cells is a granular hemocyte or white blood cell. These are the ones that are critical in how the immune system works in shellfish. So what we found is that OY15 stimulates these granular blood cells to improve their ability to fight off disease-causing bacteria or pathogens. Um, two immune functions, phagocytosis and reactive oxygen species, are specifically what OI15 stimulates. So phagocytosis is the process of these granular white blood cells circulating around in oyster blood. Um, they recognize the foreign pathogen. They are able to surround it and actually engulf it. That is the phagocytosis process. Um, within the white blood cells, there are enzymes that digest the foreign particle or pathogen. Um, during that process, reactive oxygen species is released and the foreign particle or pathogen is rendered dead, which protects them from any type of infection. So OI15 stimulates both of these immune functions, phagocytosis and reactive oxygen species, and kind of in general revs up their immune system in order to help them fight off um, bacterial pathogens. For technical details of this work, there are two companion publications in the Journal of Shellfish Research, as well as genome sequencing announcements in genome A for both probiotic strain OY15 and for our pathogenic strain B183. In order to move forward with commercializing OY15 as a product for industry use, um, we entered into a cooperative research and development agreement, otherwise known as a CRADA, um, between the Milford Lab and Invera um, in order to see if OI-15 could be manufactured or um, cultured in large-scale production effectively and economically, and to see if they could also make powder formulations which would provide a stable shelf life economic product for oyster, commercial oyster hatcheries to use to improve survival of their larvae. Um, as scientists, we are not necessarily skilled and experienced in marketing and commercializing a product, but we've got a wonderful resource right within NOAA in the NOAA Technology Partnership Office, and I am happy to have collaborated with Garrett Parks 
Um, several times, he was instrumental in walking us through the CRADA process with Envera and actually allowed this um, collaboration between the Milford Lab and Envera to happen. So thank you very much, Derek. We appreciate it. The project title of this CRADA was Large-Scale Production Trials of Milford Laboratory Probiotic Strain OI-15 for Commercialization and Hemocyte Immune Function Analyses on Commercially Available Bacillus Species Probiotic Strains. And there is a company in Westchester, Pennsylvania that's been developing naturally effective microbial formulations actually for the shrimp aquaculture industry for more than 20 years. And more recently, they've been expanding their product line into fish and shellfish probiotics as well, hence their interest in our probiotic strain OI-15. And the CRADA between the Milford Lab and Envera was a simple exchange of services. The Milford Laboratory has performed specialized flow cytometry analyses to determine immune stimulation of those white blood cells from oysters that I had described earlier by 10 bacillus strains that Envera, Envera currently produces and sells as probiotic strains for shrimp aquaculture. They were interested in seeing if one of them could potentially be used for oysters as well. And we did find one out of the 10, actually, and Vera 401, um, that had the same immune profile as probiotic strain OI-15 in that it stimulated phagocytosis and reactive oxygen species. And because it can stimulate the immune system in oysters, it could be a potential probiotic candidate for oysters. In turn, Envera has confirmed that OI-15 grows effectively and economically in large-scale culture, and they've provided the Milford Lab with stable freeze-dried and spray-dried powders of OI-15, which we have in May of 2017 confirmed in an oyster larvae challenge that the freeze-dried powder actually improves survival of oyster larvae challenged with our pathogen B183 by 20 to 30 percent. So this is pretty consistent with the live bacterial cells of probiotic strain OI-15 that we've always used in the hopes of improving survival in oysters. Um, these are just some photos from the experimental design of this particular oyster larval challenge in testing the freeze-dried and spray-dried formulations comparing them to the live bacterial cells of OI-15. Um, each one of the one-gallon pitchers were our culture containers. They contained sterile seawater and 80,000 microscopic larvae that were fed daily and dosed every other day with the probiotic strains and the different formulations, as well as challenged with our pathogenic strain B183. So the experiment started when the larvae were two days old and actively feeding on the algae and the bacteria and went for about three weeks or so until the larvae started to set um, or stick to surfaces. And we gave them a substrate to stick on by submerging um, plastic strips into each one of the pictures. The, pic the picture in the middle on the bottom um, is an example of a plastic strip and all the little dots you see on it are those, those are set oyster larvae. So that's how we knew to end the experiment. Um, the picture in the top right is an up close personal picture of one set oyster larvae that is confirmed set because you see the apron of shell that it has built around itself that they use to cement themselves to surfaces with. And that's how we knew when to end the experiment. Um, they also like to stick to the bottom of the um, culture containers as well as you can see in the lower right hand corner photo, which made it a little difficult for cleanup at the end, but we managed. Um, ultimately, Envera made a business decision not to commercialize OI-15 because they basically deal with bacillus strains of bacteria and our probiotic is Vibrio strain. But we have moved forward in transitioning probiotic strain OI-15 for industry commercialization with a company from Massachusetts called Prospective Research. So through a material transfer agreement that was signed in August of 2018, again, with Derek Parks help. Um, prospective Research received a culture of probiotic OI-15, which they will culture in large-scale bioreactors and provide us with a stable freeze-dried powder formulation, which we will have to um, test again on oyster larvae. 
And if all goes well in that powder formulation, improves oyster survival similar to that of the live bacterial cells of OI-15, we can move forward with another CRADA with prospective research for commercializing probiotic strain OI-15 and make it available to the oyster industry. Now, if you are a company that is marketing and commercializing probiotic strains, it might be beneficial to have that probiotic strain work on more than one species. So prospective research has a tremendous interest in investigating whether probiotic OY15 will work to improve survival of white leg shrimp larvae. Now, white leg shrimp are a big commercial product in Asia as well as in um, the southern United States. And hopefully in the near future, we'll be in another crater with them to do this um, analysis of OY15 and see if it works to improve survival of white leg shrimp as well. And lastly, we have entered into another material transfer agreement between the Milford Laboratory and Hawaiian Shellfish, who is a commercial hatchery raising Pacific oyster larvae um, out to seed, and they were interested in finding out whether our probiotic strain OI-15 would work on another species of oyster. Pacific oysters are Crezostria gigas, and eastern oyster, which we have on the east coast, is um, Crezostria virginica. So they have geared up um, last month for their very long production season of about 10 months out of the year, um, and we will be hearing from them soon to start um, commercial hatchery trials of OI-15 on their Pacific oyster larvae, so that's kind of exciting and can't wait to hear what they find. So to conclude, the Milford Laboratory's research partnerships with private companies has benefited tremendously NOAA's pioneering work on the isolation, screening, and methodology for developing oyster probiotics as an environmentally friendly way to prevent bacterial disease and improve survival of aquacultured oyster larvae, and therefore um, sustaining economic benefits to the U.S oyster aquaculture industry. I'd like to thank NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center and NOAA's Aquaculture Program for funding for this work. Um, thank you to Gary Whitfers, my supervisor, for his guidance and support. And thanks to Dorothy Jeffress, Dave Ballou, Joe Chermansky, and Julie Rose, um, my colleagues here at the Milford Lab for their larvae culture and microscopy expertise. And last but not least, um, thank you to Envera, Prospective Research, and Hawaiian Shellfish for the opportunity to partner with them and do some really great science. Um, thank you for your attention, everyone. Thank you. In room applause. I like that. That's great. Did you pipe that in, Diane, or are there actual people there? <laughs> we, we've got people here, too. No, no, no. <laughs> So, but I heard clapping on your end as well. We were clapping for you, and we'll continue. Oh. So. <laughs> um, all right, so we're going to do just kind of a, a between the two of us some question and answers. But if people online or here in the room or there in the room have uh, questions that you want to ask, feel free to jump in at any time. So this is more just a, kind of a conversation at this point. Um, so. A couple things that I was curious about, Diane, um, since we were just talking about the commercialization aspect of it and the CRADA, were you at all familiar with these tools before you um, developed OI-15? We knew that there was something called a cooperative research and development agreement, but it had never been utilized until we started researching OI-15 as a probiotic candidate. Um, as I said, we're grateful to you, Derek, for guiding us through that process. And it was really beneficial, and I believe it was the second CRADA in the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. So it was very beneficial, extremely beneficial. How would you describe the, the working relationship with Envera? I mean, just kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, if you're a NOAA researcher and you're thinking about entering into a CRADA, what was the level of effort for you and the, the time and everything that it took to, to 
get this going, but then also uh, on the day to day, was it um, a lot of extra work or was it manageable on your side? Um, we had spoken with the business agent at Envera, Tom Hashman, and kind of hashed out what his part of what their part of the creative would be and what our part of the creative would be you know doing work for them and we approached it trying to make it equitable both on the dollar side and on the time <coughs> invested side so they certainly have the capabilities to go up and running you know a large mass culture of a particular bacteria because that's what they do, although they work with mostly bacillus species. So it was um, a little bit difficult for them to switch to a Vibrio species because bacillus are notoriously hard to get rid of and they had to really sanitize and sterilize their bioreactors to be able to give us as pure a culture of OI-15 as possible. Um, bacillus are spore formers, so spores are very difficult to kill off by heat or other means. So, um, yeah, that's what they did for us and, and also gave us freeze-dried and spray-dried for powder formulations of OI-15. On our part, um, looking at hemocyte immune functions for 10 of their bacillus strains, we are able to run about six bacterial strains through the flow cytometer, depending on how many treatments you're looking at, in a, a one, you know, like an eight or nine hour day. Um, so we were able to get that done in a couple days for them, but then after that was analyzing the data, data entry into spreadsheets, statistics, analyzing the data to see which of those bacterial strains could be used as a probiotic candidate for oysters. Um, and it was pretty equitable, equitable on both sides. And our relationship with, with Envera was good. They allowed, you know, they were very receptive to doing this for us and were happy that we could have this capability of flow cytometry on our end. That is something that they had not done before. So that was new for them. So okay. it w it worked out really well. So um, related to that, just on, on a more generic basis, did the lab or you or your team, do you think you benefited in other ways? Obviously, we, we're trying to get the commercialization um, moving forward, but in terms of just scientific benefit and knowledge benefit, do you think um, entering into the CRADA provided you some additional benefits that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise? Absolutely did because, as I had mentioned, we are not experts in marketing and commercializing a product. We are the scientists who are doing the scientific research that can back the product and say that it does in fact do what it does. But as far as marketing and commercialization, we basically had no idea. So through the CRADA process and through you and the um, Technology Partnership Office, we have, first of all, learned a lot in the process and also realized that it really opened doors to us to provide another pathway for moving forward with making a product that could be sold to commercial oyster industry to improve survival and, and therefore improve their, you know, bottom line dollar figure. Okay. Um, and I know we've got a bunch of questions coming in. I just want to ask you one more uh, to kind of uh, close out on the, the commercialization side. Um, the, the work that you did, um, in your the discovery working with Invera, how do you think this compares with, or did you learn anything about how this compares with other uh, probiotics that are available on the market? Is this um, a breakthrough that's gonna that has definite massive commercial potential in your in your view, or is this? Um, I don't know. Just give me your, your sense of what you think uh, the magnitude of the discovery would be if we were able to get it commercialized. 
Well, the Milford Laboratory was pioneering this work on probiotics for oysters since about 2005, I believe. And we were the first to develop the methodology for screening bacterial strains for probiotics and you know, developing it as a probiotic for oysters. Um, right now it is working on Eastern oysters, so that would give a potential for commercialization to the East Coast, who, you know, who are growing Chrysostria virginica. Um, what would be really exciting is if it worked for the Pacific oysters as well, and as well as for the white leg shrimp, then and to have it commercialized for multiple species would certainly open more doors worldwide for commercialization. Um, Not just on the domestic front. Okay. It, this is, it's kind of a stupid question on my part, but so there is no existing probiotic on the market, or are there, and they're just slightly different in formulation than OY15? This is from the complete layman's terms, not understanding all of the microbiology that you have. Understood. Um, right now, there are, no, there are none on the market that are naturally occurring in oysters for oysters. There are many commercial blends of probiotics that Oyster hatchery people, as well as other hatchery people, have tried to have it work on oysters, for example. But the beauty of OI15 is that it came from an oyster. It's a totally benign strain of bacteria. And I think industry is excited to have something that is naturally occurring. Great. No, that's, and oysters. That's, that's... So, and right now also in commercial hatcheries in the United States, you're not allowed to use antibiotics. So um, having a naturally occurring probiotic strain that could prevent disease and improve survival is, is really super beneficial to the industry. Fantastic. Okay, that's that's excellent information. Um, okay, I'm going to have Katie read off a couple questions for us. I know there's some that are more um, scientifically oriented or science oriented, I should say. So um, I didn't ask you some of the questions we had talked about earlier because I think they're going to be addressed in some of these other questions. So. Okay. Hi, Dan. Okay, we have a bunch of questions online. I'm going to start off with the, the first one that came in. Um, at what point in the three-week probiotic feeding were the larvae challenged? Um, excellent question. So we normally start a larval bioassay. Our hatchery people spawn for us on a Wednesday. We wait until the larvae are 48 hours old and we set up the larval challenge in the culture containers on a Friday and we pre-dose them with the probiotic strain over the weekend so they kind of get a heads up and a head start on the probiotic effects from OI15. Um, on Monday, the following Monday, we do a water change and then re-dose them with the probiotic strain and those that are getting the pathogen will get the pathogen on the following Monday. So they're going Friday, Saturday, Sunday, without pathogen, on Monday they will get challenged with the pathogen. Awesome. And then every other day they get, they get the probiotic and the pathogen starting that Monday on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for the duration of the experiment. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to move um, kind of back towards the commercialization aspect. Um, what were the issues that prohibited Invera um, from pursuing commercialization, if you know? I think, I, well, basically they are set up to um, mass culture bacillus species. And as I had mentioned, bacillus are very, if you're trying to disinfect a bioreactor and run a different species of bacteria through it, Bacillus species are hard to get rid of because they're spore-forming bacteria, and the spores are very hardy. They're heat-resistant and hard to get rid of. So in order to switch 
to a different species of bacteria, they would probably have to invest in new bioreactors and a whole new setup of that. So I think it was a financial business decision. Okay, thank you. Um, switching back to kind of the science side, um, given that OY15 is a natural occurring strain, what kind of rights can be retained in a commercial application? Would it be the preparation, not the organism themselves? Um, so there is language in the CRADA regarding intellectual property. So the strain actually belongs to the Milford Laboratory. During commercialization, um, it depends on whether there would be a patent on it or not, and I think Derek would know the answer to that question better yeah, than me. I'm, <laughs> I'm contemplating in my head as we're going through this. So we didn't uh, we didn't file for a patent on OY15 as the organism. Uh, it's beyond its patentable period, so that even if we could have received one, which I'm not an expert in um, in that type of patenting, but um, that's beyond the scope. So it would have to be the preparation at this point, and the company could conceivably, with the work that's done under the crater, they could have that as a, um, um, they wouldn't even have to file a patent if they wanted to. They could just have it, keep it as a trade secret uh, in working with us. And the crater provides for five years of FOIA protection, so that would give them first to market and a number of years to start exploring uh, or actually getting the product into people's hands before they had to release that information if they wanted to. Likewise, they could file a patent for the, the preparation, um, the process that goes into that. So not knowing all the details of it, that's, that would be my, my guess at this point. Thank you, Derek. <laughs> Thank you, both. Okay, moving on. Um, don't know if you know this, but if um, growing other species like kelp or clams on site with the oysters, would that help or hurt the effectiveness of probiotics? Is it more risky to have multiple species, um, potentially multiple pathogens, or could it benefit the system? So in speaking of a multi-species system, um, we don't know if it works on anything other than eastern oysters at the moment. So whether we had clams growing in with them or kelp, um, not aware of, of its effects because they, it has not been tried on any other species other than eastern oysters at this point in time. Certainly there's a risk of other pathogens coming in with other species that could affect you know, one or more of the species that are growing in a multi-species system. Um, don't know the answer to that question at this point in time. No, that's great. Thank you. Okay, so we have a question about the, the freeze-drying. So if freeze-drying bacteria works to provide a viable biota, um, do the organisms actually survive the freeze-drying process and rehydration, or are they simply supplying intact genes to existing gut flora? Or do you know? Very good question. Um, Freeze-dried powder formulations of a bacterial species, when you reconstitute them, they do survive and, and you know, come back to life. So you're actually dealing with, well, you're dealing with the genetic component as well as live cells. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> We're working on pronunciation here. Yeah. Volnificus. Volnificus. Vibrio volnificus, is that what it is, Diane? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. So is that, um, <laughs> as that is a human pathogen, um, how did you ensure that the oysters are uh, safe for handling and possibly raw consumption by the consumer in case they uh, accumulate the probiotic? So we know from a very good collaboration with the University of Maryland researchers who do, had done a lot of molecular biology, state-of-the-art experiments and um, identification and gut transit times for us with 
with eastern oyster larvae and OY15, and what they found was that OY15 does not hang around in the culture water or in the larvae longer than two days. Yes, they readily ingest OY15, but it doesn't hang around for longer than two days. Um, they had done 16 sRNA analyses and um, found no signal for OY15 two days after dosing, hence the need to dose them every other day. Okay, perfect. I don't think we have any more questions online, but do you have any questions in your room or questions in our room here? Nobody has any questions in my room. <laughs> Um, one thing I was going to ask you, Diane, um, we had talked yesterday a little bit about the kind of the history of this, the discovery of it, and you were talking about how it was really a kind of a home run and an amazing uh, occurrence that you were able to discover this so quickly. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So we started looking for probiotics for oysters by culturing the digestive glands of adult eastern oysters from right here in Long Island Sound, assuming that if they were alive and healthy, that what their gut flora would contain would be either benign bacteria or perhaps probiotic bacteria. So out of 20 oysters, we had gotten 26. Now, growing them on auger, we had 26 different looking colonies that grew up on auger from these 20 oysters. Once we had them identified, um, we only had six different bacterial strains that came out of these 20 oyster digestive glands. And out of those six, one of them, OY15, was able to inhibit our pathogen of choice, our Vibrio corolliticus, um, on auger. So, Really, it was a home run because you could be looking for hundreds and hundreds of strains of bacteria and not find a probiotic bacteria. So out of six different strains, we found one that was pretty amazing. That's it was very, very, very lucky. <laughs> that is fantastic. So did we uh, We have another question? Yeah, we have a follow-up okay. question follow -up. online. Um, I would like to know if you tested um, the... Immuno I'm going to stumble over this word, immunological response um, in adult oysters or larvae? We used adult oysters. That's an excellent question, actually. Uh, we used adult oysters. We used the blood. We drew blood from adult oysters because larvae are microscopic and it's pretty hard to draw blood from them. So we used adult eastern oyster blood as the model for what's happening in the larvae. Thank you. Very cool. I have a question. Yeah. All right, we got one in the room. Uh, I apologize, I came in a little late. Is, is there any signs of uh, pathogenic resistance to the uh, OY15? Would that ever happen, do you think? Anything is possible with bacteria because bacteria are able to pass on pathogenicity genes from one bacteria to another. We have not seen that in the 15 so or years that we have been working with OY15. Okay, very good. Thank you. Interesting. All right. Um, I think we are out of questions. Everybody is well informed. Um, Diane, in your in your honor, I had uh, yogurt here on the table with me, so I'm fully. Oh, nice. Thank you. Fully conditioned Derek? and. Yeah. We actually have one more question in my room here. Oh, neat. Okay. So my question has to do with what's next to shrimp. Do you have any, is the setup is going to be the same as the oysters, or what is going to happen? The question is, what is going to happen with shrimp, with the white leg shrimp work next? Um, we have to figure out that experimental design. It would probably, the protocol would probably be similar to what we had done um, for oysters, but certainly white leg shrimp are not a species that is found in the Northeast. 
the United States, so we would have to go through extra measures to keep either adults or larvae contained and then um, dispose of them properly at the end of our experiments because there is, you cannot bring, you know, foreign species and not have it contained into an area that they're not common to. So, but, but as far as our, our methodology for developing, for testing probiotic OI-15 on um, shrimp, we would have to determine the dosage. It may not be the same as oysters. Um, the 10 to the 3 colony forming units per ml that works on oysters may not work on shrimp. So we would have to determine that. And exposures would be probably done similarly to that of oysters. So that's going to be a work in progress. <laughs> Thank you, Excellent. Michael. Um, we do have one other question that popped up, which I think I'm going to address. Um, so I'll. <laughs> Thank you. Let me read that off for you, Derek. Um, uh, what response do you have to NOAA researchers that are resistant to contributing research to private industry that will see a profit in the future, but the NOAA researcher will not? So that it's um, a really interesting question and one that comes up, I think, in a lot of people's minds, if not in actual discussion. <laughs> Uh, when you're talking with the, the technology partnerships office and what we're trying to do, uh, and truthfully, there's there are different ways to look at it. There is the publication, peer-reviewed publication, and the benefit of humanity uh, as a general sense, and somebody may choose to take advantage of that or not. The common thought in the tech transfer world is that we are providing some incentive to companies to um, take on a technology and really move it forward by de-risking that involvement on their side. And by that I mean, um, not to get too geeky or anything, but the, the traditional path forward is to patent something uh, and protect that technology, and that provides that level of de-risking for the company so that we can then, when we license it to them, they have assurance that nobody else is going to be doing the exact same thing, investing all of that money to try to bring something to market at the same time because they have a legal right to do this for a period of approximately 20 years under a patent license agreement. So that's the, the common theory, but part of what I wanted to get across in this presentation is that there's a number of ways to do this. Just because we've worked with Envera doesn't mean that some other company can't take advantage of it as well under a CRADA. So the CRADA is a much more open instrument and much more open agreement that allows broader collaboration. So if you are interested in a more proactive approach with industry, but you don't want to really lock it down and or you know the, the financial side of it makes you itch a little bit, then the CRADA might be the way to go because we don't have to go through the patenting process we can still get information out to uh, technology out to industry, and it actually gets used. That's really the important thing. A lot of, um, maybe not so much this particular technology, but other technologies get developed at a specific lab for a very specific purpose. They are used for that purpose at the lab, but then they never see the light of day otherwise. And some of these inventions may be game changers. They may have other uses. So that's really the point that we're trying to get to is that by engaging industry, there is the possibility of a technology getting more broad exposure, broader usage, and even more benefit to humanity um, in that respect. The, the one thing I will address in addition is your your last point, the researcher themselves not receiving financial benefit. If we did choose to go down a patent route as opposed to doing a CRADA or just doing a publication, uh, then NOAA researchers are allowed to accrue royalties under the law. So there's an administrative order that allows, uh, that sets aside the percentages for the NOAA researcher, the NOAA laboratory. Um, both can accrue benefits from royalties under uh, under current law. So that's something to keep in mind. It may not be the, the path that you choose, but it is certainly one that's available to, to everybody within NOAA, and we're happy to, to work with you on that. 
So after saying all that, I'm going to wait for just a second to see if anybody else has a question. But otherwise, I think we're getting close to wrapping up. For, um, for additional information and regarding that last question, the next session that we're doing in March is going to be another way that we used a CRADA to get a technology that probably wasn't going to make it out of the lab into a company's hands, a very small company, and they're actually now starting to to sell this technology. So if anybody's interested in that, the, the next session will be particularly interesting for you as well. So with that, I'll, I'll thank the, the NOAA Library. I will thank Diane and the Milford Lab. You guys are fantastic. I can't think of a better group of people to, to work with. We love you guys. And, um, love you too, Derek. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. We will have a, another NOAA Innovators talk in March. Uh, the exact date is uh, being pinned down, but there will definitely be an email or several that go out. <laughs> so uh, thank you and uh, goodbye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.